Welcome to Lore Revolution, the show where we explore the production history and pop culture impact of our favourite factions, technologies and characters from the realm of science fiction and fantasy. So far we've covered many species from the Star Trek universe, including the Klingons, Romulans and the Borg. But today we're looking at everyone's favourite wide-necked tyrants, it's the Cardassians. First of all though, a shameless plug. If you like what I do on this channel and want to help it grow, consider joining my patrons or YouTube members. You get to see videos up to a week early get access to exclusive behind the scenes content and many other benefits. Links and buttons down below. Now the shameless self promotion is out of the way, let's get stuck in. For much of the next generation, there was a drive by many of the writers to create a new recurring foe for the Federation. The original series had found that foe in the Klingons, but many felt TNG needed a new main antagonist for itself as by this point the Klingons were Federation allies. Ultimately the Romulans would come to fill this role as they appeared more times in the next generation than any other Star Trek show. Previously in this series we mentioned how the Ferengi were initially created to fill this role, that is until their debut episode in which everyone hated them. The Borg were another suggestion, however, they were felt to be too powerful to be a regular recurring villain. It was in this quest for new villains that the writers of TNG would end up creating the Cardassians. Unlike the Klingons or Romulans, the Cardassians weren't conceived of by any one writer. Their debut episode, Season 4's The Wounded, had its story written by Stuart Charno, Sarah Charno and Cy Chermak, with a teleplay by Jerry Taylor. Taylor was the one who came up with the name. Originally she settled on Kirkassians, however writer Joe Minoski later pointed out to Taylor, the Kirkassians were a real people who lived on Earth in classical antiquity, and are in fact a real ethnic group who exist today. Thus Taylor played around with the letters a little more until she settled on Cardassians. In the script, the Cardassians were described as humanoid aliens, sleek, handsome, intense. With such a broad description, costume designer Bob Blackman and makeup designer Michael Westmore had plenty of room to play around and get creative. From the sound of their name, Westmore decided to make them reptile-like. He was famously inspired by an obscure abstract painting, depicting a woman with broad shoulders and what looked like a spoon on her forehead. As an aside, I tried my damnedest to find this painting, but no luck unfortunately. However, what really helped Westmore settle on the final design was the casting. The first on-screen Cardassian was to be played by Mark Alemo. Alemo had already appeared twice before in the show, first in season 1's Lonely Among Us, in which he was unrecognisable as an Attican ambassador, he next appeared in the season finale, The Neutral Zone, as the Romulan commander Tobek. Alemo would play the very first on-screen Cardassian, Gull Masset. Having been cast, Michael Westmore actually used Mark Alemo's natural physical features in furthering his Cardassian design. Alemo had a naturally long neck and heavy brow. This led to Westmore creating a long, sloping neck and what he called snake-like shoulders. Westmore then added in the spoon shape to the forehead to complete the look. The skin tone for the Cardassians in their first episode was a lot more pink, and Gul Masset was notably given facial hair in order to give him a more authoritative appearance. For their signature ships, the episode introduced the Galar class, although it's not named as such until much later. Usually ships in TNG were designed by model maker Gregory Jean. However, during production, he was busy designing another first appearance starship, the Nebula class. Thus, model makers Ed Miriaki and Tom Hudson, working from a design by Rick Sternback, built the Cardassian ship. The shape of the Galar was inspired by the Egyptian Ankh symbol. This Egyptian influence also resulted in the sandy, yellowy colouring. With their looks cemented in script finish, the Cardassians made their debut in The Wounded. In contrast to the Ferengi, who everyone hated when they first appeared, the vast majority of the production team really liked the Cardassians. Michael Westmore said that they were one of his favourite designs, but it was the writers who especially liked him. While much of the team expected them to be an Alien of the Week, the strong positive reception to the episode meant many were eager to bring them back. The reason they were so well liked was the depth of character they offered. The Klingons, for example, were first introduced as brutal conquerors, the unquestioned villains of the story. The Cardassians, however, were much more nuanced, and there was an interesting dynamic between the three Cardassian characters first seen in The Wounded. Director Chip Chalmers, who directed The Wounded, said, We introduced a new enemy that's finally able to speak on the level of Picard. 
They're not grunting, they're not giggling, they're not mute or all-knowing entities. Here are Cardassians who also graduated first in their class and are able to carry on highly intelligent conversations with Picard. But they're sinister as hell. Michael Piller, Robert Hewitt Wolf, and Mark Alemo, however, felt the Cardassians were still a little one note in their debut episode. While they had been defined in terms of personality, they hadn't yet been defined culturally. Their next notable appearance was in Season 5's Ensign Row. Originally, it was to be the Romulans who appeared in this episode, but producer Rick Berman, being fond of the Cardassians, suggested bringing them back for this outing. Here we are introduced to the Bajorans, a race subjugated and enslaved by the Cardassians under a brutal occupation. Following this episode, however, the Cardassian design was changed somewhat. Most apparent are the new costumes. Honestly, I think their first costumes look like something Crichton from Red Dwarf would wear. The headgear and facial hair was also removed and their skin tone became a more pale greyish colour. Another alteration to the design came in the later episode The Chase, which featured the first female Cardassian, Gull Oset. To differentiate the genders, Westmore included a blue coloration to the forehead spoon shape and other blue marks on the neck ridges, as well as a different hairstyle. However, it was earlier in this same season we got a more detailed insight into Cardassian culture in Chain of Command. Chain of Command features Picard going on a covert mission to stop the Cardassians developing a bioweapon. However, he is soon captured and taken before Gull Madred, played by the awesome David Warner. Although Madred is a truly scary villain, it's through his exchanges with Picard we come to understand more about Cardassian history and society. We learn that the Cardassians were once a peaceful people of artists and poets. However, a sudden lack of natural resources eventually led to a societal collapse where widespread violence and famine were commonplace. It was the military which restored order and expanded into other territories to acquire more resources. This backstory is beautifully conveyed to us in Warner's performance and the excellent writing for the character. Seeing himself as a strong and proud man, shaken to his core, when Picard calls him out as being a scared little boy inside the shell of a tyrant. The two-parter is one of the best of TNG, but its approach to the Cardassians was likely a carryover from the show which made them primary antagonists. While development of Deep Space Nine had already started by the time the episode Ensign Row had premiered, the show's creators Rick Berman and Michael Piller hadn't yet imagined using the Cardassians for the show. As they continued to develop further Cardassian stories for TNG, the idea of delving further into this people and their society made the prospect of using them for DS9's mainstay villains an attractive prospect. The Bajoran occupation introduced in Ensign Row was then folded into the backstory of Deep Space Nine, and the Cardassians were named as the original builders of the titular space station. Having chosen the Cardassians as the show's big bad, the creative team really wanted to dive into how the Cardassians thought. They settled on the Cardassians being an imperial people who liked order, but also had a sense of personal honour and duty. For much of season one, they were the go-to villains of many episodes. However, it was Duet which started a paradigm shift. Duet is a simply brilliant episode, with a powerhouse performance from guest star Harris Yulin, who is eventually revealed to be Amin Maritza, a traumatised file clerk from the Bajoran occupation, hoping to have the Cardassians face their crimes by impersonating his former overseer. It was from this episode Ira Stephen Bear coined the Cardassian monologue term. He said, Cardassians love to speak. The Cardassian monologue is great and the Cardassians like to talk. They're also great fun to write. Robert Hewitt Wolfe said, Ira characterises the race as a bunch of people who talk like the people in Russian novels. They talk a lot. Following Duet, Deep Space Nine showcased a slew of fascinating, complex, and sympathetic Cardassian characters. It was through these characters we as viewers came to understand the Cardassians as a nuanced and layered society, rather than painting them all as bad guys. They're similar in many ways to the Romulans of the 24th century, but with the Romulans having a thing for secrecy, audiences were rarely given opportunities to really understand them as a people. The Cardassians, on the other hand, are a people who are often convinced of their superiority, but also heavily oppressed by the Obsidian Order and the military, two organisations which are also at odds with one another. This complex dynamic is often perfectly distilled by the relationship between totally just a humble Taylor Garrick and the former dictator of Bajor, Gul Dukat, played exceptionally by Mark Alemo in his second and best Cardassian role. Dukat and Garrick are probably worth an entire video each, 
so I'll probably just make those one day. Deep Space Nine presents us with a truly epic story for the Cardassians as a people, on a personal level, and one with real galactic consequences. We meet them as the militaristic villains many see them as, then a liberated society which is soon beaten and broken by a Klingon invasion, restored to strength by the Dominion, and then fighting for their freedom once again. DS9 showrunner Ira Stephen Bear once said, you could give them their own spin-off show, the Cardassians are so good, and I certainly see why. While the Klingons and Romulans have been around for far longer and maybe far more popular within the fanbase, the Cardassians were given a depth and complexity not often seen with the others. While they have their moments, of course, the Klingons are often glory-seeking brutish warriors and the Romulans are usually scheming secretive officers, with few exceptions. The Cardassians, on the other hand, over the course of Deep Space Nine, really feel like they're part of a living, breathing society and culture. The Cardassian characters are diverse and layered, with guest stars and recurring actors giving some of the best performances in the entire Star Trek franchise. In the novel trilogy Millennium, an alternate timeline sees the entire Cardassian Union destroyed by a vengeful Weyoun, with less than a million of the species left by the end. This book series also explains that the spoon shape is the Cardassian equivalent of the belly button. Cardassian myth states that this feature came about when the Cardassians were touched by their gods and is a sign of wisdom. In a standalone novel called Fearful Symmetry, the book explains that Gul Dukat and Gul Maset were actually cousins. Maset grew his facial hair in a deliberate attempt to differentiate himself from his famous cousin. If you've watched this channel long enough, you'll know I don't really care much for this kind of fix it in post attitude to canon. And in the novel The Fall, after an assassination of the heads of state of both the Cardassians and the Federation, Garrick becomes the leader of the entire Cardassian Union. An interesting sounding plot to be sure, but to be honest, I highly doubt Garrick would ever become leader of Cardassia. I mean, he's just a humble tailor after all. So there we have the Cardassians. It's surprising on examination just how successful and well written they became as a species. Pop culture gives plenty of love to the Klingons and Romulans, so how about a bit more appreciation for the Cardassians? Anubis asks, are there any characters you hated at the beginning, but by the end of the series they became one of your favourites? While he didn't become one of my favourites, I liked Dr. Bashir a lot more in later DS9. I found him super irritating in the first few seasons and a bit better in season 4, but it was after his genetic engineering storyline I think the writers really found something interesting to do with him, so by the end I liked the character a lot more. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.